Okay, I'm going to call the Longmont Housing Authority Board of Commissioners Tuesday, July 16, 2024 meeting to order. Um, let's have a roll call. I will start with Chair Peck. <laughs> Switch gears. Um, Commissioner Vidalda Perry. Commissioner Rodriguez. Commissioner McCoy. Commissioner Christ. Uh, Marcia, we're doing roll call. Can you hear us? Are we on mute? On oh, no, no, we are on mute. Okay. We're we're not even on camera. There we go. Oh, there we go. Yes. There you are. Should we do? So again? we're doing roll call, and it's up to you. We're at you now, Marcia. Oh, I'm here. <laughs> <laughs> yes, you are. Commissioner Marcia Martin. Thank you. Molly? Here. All right, next we're going to go over to the other side of the table. Um, Lauren Sully, uh, Assistant Director, LHA. Um, Harold Dominguez, Interim Executive Director, LHA. <laughs> Eric Morris, Executive Assistant. Kendra Daniels, Accounting Supervisor. Mm -hmm. Eugene May, City Attorney. Okay, Katie. We're all, we're Katie we're needs to. Oh, yeah. Oh, there she is. Yeah, Katie. Hi, I'm sorry, Katie Belichick. <laughs> Thank you. So um, now we're at agenda revisions and submissions of documents. Do we have any revisions to this agenda? Okay. Um, no submissions of different documents either. Okay. I need a vote to approve the June 18th minutes. Um, um, wait a minute. I actually have a question about the minutes. Oh, okay. Um, um, let's vote, take a second, then discuss. Can I have somebody I, move? I move the agenda uh, through the minutes. Second. It's been moved by Council McCoy, uh, Commissioner McCoy, second by Commissioner uh, Rodriguez to move the minutes, the uh, June 18th minutes. Mm -hmm. Now we'll open it up for discussion. Uh, okay. Um, Agenda, uh, well, item two, agenda revisions and submission mm -hmm. was approved six to zero, but then number three was approved five to zero, and then later on it says that uh, Vice Chair Hidalgo Perry arrived at 710. So I'm thinking mm. she didn't vote for one of those. Both, both of those. Yeah, wow. probably number two since it came earlier. And then um, also, I was absent that evening, but I was actually, actually at the CML conference, so I was an excused city related so event what, that I was at. So, what was the motion? Did it say unanimous? It says, um, well, it says 6 to 0, which was um, everyone. It was 5 0. 5 0. Five zero. Okay, five zero. so we need and to then correct that. And would be off yeah. of the gender revision. Yeah, on number 2. On number 2. Five zero. Okay. okay. So um, we need to move to make that amendment. Amend item number two and mm -hmm. uh, to amend number one that I was absent at the cost. Or, or just yeah, that we don't. We don't care. No, that's fine. I second that. Okay, it's been moved and seconded that um, the agenda of June 18th be amended to take <coughs> off Councilor Hidalgo Faring's name on the roll call. Yeah, for the um, agenda revisions and submissions of documents, and that the vote be recorded as 5 to 0. Let's vote on that amendment. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. All those opposed? Aye. All those opposed? No one. So that carries six to zero with Commissioner Yarbrough absent. Now we need to vote on the minutes as amended. I move the June 18th, 2024 minutes as amended. Second. So it's been moved by myself, seconded by Councilor Hidalgo Faring. Um, is there any discussion? Seeing none, let's vote. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. All those opposed? Aye. Thank you. So that carries six to zero with com with Commissioner Yarbrough absent. Whew. We 
are now public invited to be heard. I do see some public here. Um, would you like to speak? <laughs> you have three minutes if you'd like to speak. I don't know. Okay. Uh, if I do, uh, I just want to stand. Stand. stand, state your name, please. <laughs> Since I was asked to come, I've been gone for open heart surgery. Oh, I'm sorry. Georgetta Johnston, and I live at 320 Homestead Parkway, Longwood, Colorado, 80504. Um, it was March uh, 6th, or March 7th, and it was emergency, but I'm doing okay now. I'm in my right mind. Uh, I like living at Spring Creek, but we were talking today about some of the things that's not getting done. It's, it's beginning to look like a junkyard, and I don't want to be offensive or unkind. Looks like with the money stuff, they could be kind of fixing things more than they're doing. So there's been a lot of complaints. So I was kind of asked uh, if I want to come tonight, and I'm, I don't want it in a bad way. I just want it in a nice way because it's a, a real nice place. So uh, I guess I'm waiting to see how or where. We did have John talk today and stuff, but, you know, he doesn't really know. So uh, different things have been promised, and, and I know it takes time to work things out. but. Uh, Lord willing, we're going to be getting them done because it's like I said, we don't want a junkyard. We, it's a beautiful place. <laughs> so uh, I mentioned that, and then I did mention to John that I found alcohol in the uh, TV room and took it to him. So, you know, different things like that are a little troubling. I don't do that, but uh, I'm not a person that wants to be a troublemaker, too. I want a good place to live and uh, be a blessing and not, you know, complain in the wrong way. Just encourage, work together where we can get some of this stuff done. Thank you for letting me talk and it's nice seeing all these special people. Oh, I'm so <laughs> glad that you came through that surgery. Yeah. Oh yes, thank you very much. Thank you. So. Okay. okay. Yeah. So my name is Arlene Zorkman and I live at 2007 Winding Drive. So I attended both Fall River at Spring Creek coffee with co coffee and conversations today and uh, several things came up that I'm hoping are going to be covered tonight because I would like to be able to at least respond back to them and say this is an answer to your question. So both places talked about cameras and what's going on with the cameras um, and both places talked about the landscaping contract and the concerns about that they have. By the way the grass is looking great in both places. Um, and then the other thing that they both talked about was what's going on with the phone system out there and the contract with that. So those were the things that were particular of interest. Great. Thank you very much. Seeing no one close public invited to be heard. And we're on to old and new business. We have four resolutions. The first one is LHA 2024-12, Acceptance of Colorado Health Foundation Grant and loaning of the funds for the Ascent at Hope Crossing project. And I am going to call on Molly O'Donnell. Sure, thank you. Um, commissioners, the tonight's first item is about accepting the two. Sure. You from the Colorado Health Foundation to support the building of the Early Childhood Education Center at the Ascent for Hobart Crossing. Um, this is the one of last two last items on Ascent that we're not prepared in time for the closing resolution that you all considered in June um, because we were still for this one still negotiating with the Colorado Health Foundation. Um, so we have a form of the grant here. Um, we are doing final negotiations with them, but it, at all of the major pieces are covered here in the form of the grant that you see. Mm -hmm. And so um, but a part of the approval is to allow us to wrap up those negotiations as long as it's um, in its substantial form that you're approving tonight. Um, it also allows us to loan those funds into the partnership, which we do need LHA board acceptance to do. Um, and then one key piece that surrounds this is uh, the leasing of that early childhood education center. We've been working with Colorado Health Foundation, Wild Plum, and Penrose, our development partner, for some time to figure out the best scenario for leasing. And so 
Um, the proposal is for LHA to enter into the master lease so that LHA and the partnership have that le less leasing relationship. And then LHA would sublease to the Wild Plum Center. That just turned out to be the best way to get everyone comfortable with what they needed all the way up to our tax credit investor. So Katie is also here tonight that can answer any more detailed questions if they come up, but I wanted to open that up for questions if there are any. Are there any questions from the commissioners on this resolution? Um, interim director. Yeah. Uh, so commissioners, one of the things that I wanted to say about this grant, um, Matt asked me a question before. Mm -hmm. This is a significant grant from the Colorado Health Foundation for Early Child Care. Mm -hmm. uh, when you look at a $2 million grant for this, as you all know, as we were heading into this, there was some question as to whether or not we were going to even be able to include early child care because it's not in a qualified census tract, so we couldn't include it in basis. Um, but for the Colorado Health Foundation investing in this project, um, we were not going to make the numbers we needed to include it. So definitely wanted to publicly thank the Colorado Health Foundation for this grant. Um, because it is allowing us to, for the first time in Long Island, include early childhood mm -hmm. education yeah. with affordable housing, which is attaching to the goals that you all set both as the city council and as uh, a housing authority board. Uh, the city also put in five hundred and seventy-five thousand. How much? Five hundred twenty-five thousand. Five hundred twenty-five thousand from ARPA funds again to fill this gap. So. Again, building the capital stack, but the Colorado Health Foundation is really the group that allowed us to accomplish this. I, I do have a question. Um, this is a great idea to have this all in a commercial area, too, where mm -hmm. the commercial is very accessible. It's the, I was just confused about the addresses. Is the uh, uh, childhood education going to be in the front part of Walgreens or behind where the homes are going to be? Mm, it's Behind Walgreens, uh, it's on the northwest corner of the project, and I can't, it's a, you know that center where you have Baskin Robbins, and yeah, yeah, yeah it's, it's going to be diagonally across from that. Okay. And these are separate homes, or all attached? It's all, it's all, it's more like an apartment um, style structure. It's, the difference in this project is going to be it's going to be one through four bedrooms, which is also distinctly different than anything we've done thus far. Mm -hmm. Because when we were looking at our housing and study, one of the things that was clearly identified is the need for affordable family housing. Mm -hmm. um, the only other affordable family housing that we currently have in our portfolio is Aspen Meadows neighborhood, mm -hmm. which is how many units? Yeah, it's a little. How many? 28. So 28 units. So this is going to be a significant increase into non-age restricted family units, which is something that we are focusing on as we look to further development because it's just a, a void in our community. It's a nice place for Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I do have a go ahead. Question. Just for clarification, um, these this early childhood center is giving priority to the individuals who yes. are the families that are living there. Yes. So I wanted to yeah. make sure, yeah, got <laughs> there's a There's a priority. Um, it's uh -huh. not strictly for those living in the housing, just because Wild Plum obviously needs yes. to fill the spaces. Yes. But we do have an agreement with them that we're going to do some pre-enrollment um, and pre-leasing alongside to, to kind of push that forward on the front end. And then as well, there's a uh, two-week period that if they have an open spot that they're going to hold that for um, individuals that live in the housing and then obviously if, if no one takes that spot then it'll open up to the general public. Um, there are some caveats with that. If, if, if we do a Head Start slot, slots, mm -hmm. there's some other factors that have to go into that. Um, but they're going to kind of work towards if, if, if they are Head Start spots, how they integrate the housing into kind of the point system with Head Start spots. Mm -hmm. Is it still too early in the process to know what the capacity is? 
or as far as how many children how many children would it serve um it's three classrooms and i'd have to i'd have to look on the ages we anticipate uh, i think it's around like 40 children okay um so i think it's a little bit less than that but three classrooms three classrooms okay Thank you. Uh, so these monies are specifically allocated or going to be allocated for construction, correct? Correct. And so sustainable programming funding will have to come from somewhere else? Yeah, that's what we're working on with Wild Plum. Mm -hmm. So Wild Plum will be charged with that piece of it and, and working on They do get, what's the program in the county modeling? CCAP. CCAP. So, you CCAP know, funding. when CCAP opens up. Ahead. And the Longmont Community Foundation is very interested in stepping in to help them stand up the center. <coughs> they should get a fully built out shell of the center, but then for furnishings and equipment and toys and books and all of the things that actually come into opening up an early childhood education center. We've got some very, very good conversations going with them on that. The, the value in this, if we go back to the conversations we had on early child care, is, is really one of the biggest impediments for that right now space. Mm -hmm. And space that are low to no cost. And, and those are things that we're trying to, to bring into this project. Well, as you know, Jim Golden has told us over and over again, be very careful about the one-time funds, right? Mm -hmm. so, yeah. yeah. So yeah, this is yeah. construction. Construction yeah. is obviously an appropriate place yeah. to put one-time yeah. funds. So mm -hmm. just checking to see what what the thinking was surrounding a further funding of program. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and that's part of what you'll say. <coughs> maybe I think it's in this one is this also allows us to then move the money from the Health Foundation to the mm -hmm. Housing Authority then to the project itself. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Do we have any more questions? I, will. I just want to make sure that we highlight that it is a grant like any other grant and like most grants, um, if you fail to succeed, then they can be recovered. Mm -hmm. um, this one gets a little more specific in those recoverability milestones. So we did a lot of work with Penrose to organize um, who would take responsibility in the very small chance event that that had ever happened. Um, and really, we think that we can avoid it altogether because if they're looking, the Colorado Health Foundation is looking for service enriched housing. And so an early childhood education center is one of those. But then also, if we absolutely had to, which no, not one part of us anticipates this, um, we've got a plan in place with this grant to backfill with another um, form of service enriched housing if we absolutely will while Plum could not move forward, which all signs are pointing to that is not a possibility. Mm -hmm. But I just want you to know that there is a, LHA does a share with Penrose in the guarantee to make sure this funding stays in the project. And there's three or four steps before we can get to that component in terms of reaching out to other child care providers. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we even talked about worst case scenario, if we had to, figuring out how on the city side and in our health and human service departments we could slide in and perform the function. So before we ever get to the point Molly talked about, there's like three or four other oh, things yes. okay. that we'll work for. So we think the risk profile is really low on this one. Okay. Maybe just to note that um, recoverability period for this grant is only for the first five years. Um, so it's a five year kind of time frame in which it's really relevant. Again, obviously, this is all worst case scenario. Um, and so to have an operating childhood education center um, for five years, we're not, we feel very confident and hope that it's well beyond um, five years. So, mm -hmm. or anticipate, not hope. I think it's an amazing project, yeah. and I think that uh, Longmont should be very, very proud that we are doing this project. Mm -hmm. So, um, are there any more questions or discussion? Mm -hmm. So, I need a motion for I'll resolution 20 2024-12. I'll move resolution LHA 2024-12. Second. It's moved by Commissioner Susan Hidalgo, seconded by Commissioner McCoy. Uh, is there any more discussion? Seeing none, let's vote. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. All those opposed? 
And that passes six to zero with uh, Commissioner Yarbrough absent. Thank you, Molly and Harold. That's all, man. So we're now at resolution LHA 2024-13, approval of first amendment to the intergovernmental agreement with City of Longwell for 2024 support and services. Does this go to Molly as well? It does. So this is a pretty straightforward amendment of our annual IGA. Uh, really what it does is uh, indicate that Tracy D. Francesco, who is a city employee that was contracted through this IGA to do the LHA's HCB work and other compliance work, she has retired from the city, um, but she does did want to keep working for LHA, so she has retired from the city and then accepted the position on the LHA see. side. Um, and so this reflects that appointment to that position. And then there's a second piece that I'll pause in case there's any questions on that first. So this is, uh, that's amazing that she wants yeah. to continue. Yep, Great. after I think 17 years is what it ended up being to oh, city wow. service. So. Um, and then on the second, is Tracy there tonight? She's not there, right? No, okay. And then on the second side, um, LHA's forestry division has expressed interest to help with tree care services. Uh, they really see LHA as an extension of the city, um, residents just like residents may, and so they want to help LHA have a more robust tree care program, and so they've offered those services. And so that's all outlined here in the IGA. Um, it really is not a very it's not a very heavy lift for them um, in terms of workload and capacity for the few trees that LHA does have on its property. So it seems to be a win-win for everyone, and that is reflected in this IGA as well. Great. Is there any discussion, commissioners? Questions? Well, I have a question. Wasn't this on our consent agenda? Yes, you did see this already as, yeah. as your rule at City Yeah, so I'm just function wise going how how you see it, it twice. Okay. But because you have to uh, the way it's structured, you have to act on it as the city and then you have to act on it as a housing authority as well. Okay. Great. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Good catch though. So can I have a motion if there's no more discussion on twenty twenty four thirteen? I move. 2024-13. Seconded. Moved by Commissioner Chris, seconded by Commissioner McCoy. Um, any more discussion? No? All right, let's vote. All those in favor? Aye. 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 All those opposed? And that passes 6 to, one, six to 0 with Commissioner Yarbrough absent. On to the next resolution, LAJ 2024-14. Accept second amendment to the intergovernmental agreement for CDBG funds for the LHA security cameras project. <coughs> Excuse me, security cameras project. Are we back to Molly? Mm -hmm. uh, so this is just a simple amendment to that IGA for the CDBG funds to extend the timeframe until the end of 2024. Um, this has been a long time. This project has been a long time coming. Um, the residents have been asking for it for a long time. And so what we really got tied up in in the last, uh, between a year and a half and two years since the city council originally approved the action plan to use the funds for this purpose, um, is procurement. And so coming up, we wanted to follow the city system, or city progress on coming up with a citywide system um, that LHA could tap into to have economy of scale and make sure that everyone had access to the camera footage if needed, including sharing more efficiently with public safety. And so we wanted to follow the process that the city was following, um, which used ARPA funds to try and come up with that integrated camera system. Um, so progress had been made there, and there is a contract in place with a camera provider, and then we do know um, a separate contractor that has the relationship with the city for the ongoing, maybe the install and ongoing maintenance. And so we intend to use those CDBG funds on purchase of the equipment only through this federally procured contract that the city did, um, doing an LHA um, cooperative version of that contract. And we're getting that all finalized right now, with, and we're doing a site walk with the contractor later this month. 
And so the hope is to have all of these cameras purchased and then installed here by the purchased by the end of the summer and installed by the end of the year. Um, so we have made a lot of progress, but it was we had to jump through quite a few hoops. Um, but so this just, just gives us some extra time to make sure we get that all implemented by the end of the year. Yeah, so to update you all the camera project, um, so you have to federalize the funds. And federalizing the funds based on the different funding sources really created a lot of process that we had to go through. Um, and then finding a system that really was more of an open platform based system because so many of these systems that were in place are proprietary. What I mean by proprietary is that you have to use all of their equipment. You can't integrate other equipment into the system. So, you know, we started looking for um, bids that were in the open system that met the federal requirements. A lot of those were the proprietary systems. We then went to moving down the best value approach in terms of how to acquire it how we were going to acquire it, we ended up finding a bid. Um, the platform that we're going to be using is Milestone, and so Milestone is more of an open based platform that not only allows us to utilize cameras, but within the camera system you can in integrate um, parking management, you can in 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 integrate access control, and so what we mean by access control is when you buzz into facilities, so over time, if you place a camera there, when somebody buzzes in, it can capture images. And, and so those are some things that are pretty important for us from a security perspective because we do have people routinely getting into facilities who aren't supposed to be there. Um, as we look at parking control and where people are supposed to park, we can have cameras that can look at the area and then with the AI platforms, they can tell us where people aren't supposed to be and things like that, so we can integrate it within the system. That's the LHA side that they're getting the benefit of, the stuff we're doing in the city. From the city side, uh, the cameras that we're utilizing can also monitor stream flow, water height, and, and creeks. Uh, if the cameras are placed strategically, they can also take the feed and use it in Be Becky, the train, train app that Becky was creating, that once you get enough locations, you can start manage timing. So this is really a holistic solution that we're bringing into play and that's another piece that took time because we're, we're often too apt to find single solutions um, and the world's changing so fast we really wanted that open platform and that's what Milestone's going to give us. Sounds amazing. In terms of, so I'm, I'm looking at a schedule right now in terms of the conversion of cameras. So timing-wise for the Housing Authority properties, um, we have to get the cameras, the, uh, the Project NOLA cameras transferred first. Um, and that's because I think that service ends in the end of August or the first part of September. So we're going to transfer those cameras first. In addition, because of some of the issues that we're seeing throughout our community, we're probably going to also need to put new cameras in other locations. And so, Lanyon Park, for example, is, is an area that we're seeing some issues developing that we've been working on. So last week, I walked that area with um, police on a few occasions. Mm -hmm. um, David Bell on Parks, and so we've identified some additional cameras we're going to need to place there. So the timing, as I'm looking through this, is um, I think we should have all of those cameras in addition done by mid-August. Once we get through that, then we'll start looking at different properties and the situations that we have versus the addition to the cameras in terms of using data t to tell us where we go first in terms of what we're seeing. So um, I'll talk a little bit about this. Um, Molly, did we have enough, did we have funding for the Aspen Meadows neighborhood? Yes, the neighborhood, Fall River, Spring Creek. Yeah. Uh, so, so, one of the first properties that I'm probably going to look at is Aspen Meadows neighborhood, just because of some issues that we're seeing out there, that we've seen within the last week. Mm -hmm. 
and I'll talk about that in the security update. So when we look at where we're going to place the new cameras, we're going to, that's going to be a data-driven approach based on things like calls for service, activity that we're seeing. Um, and so it's not going to just be we're going to start moving this one for we go through a list. It's going to be a data-driven process in terms of what we start bringing on and how we bring the systems on. How many cameras are you talking about purchasing? Uh, for the housing authority, how many is it? It's We're doing our site walk in two weeks to confirm the amount. Um, based on site walks that happened about a year ago when we were planning this out, it's something, it depends on the size of the property and the specific needs. But for example, we're proposing 13 cameras at Village Place. Um, that's two primary outdoor cameras and then a multitude inside. And it's a little bit different because some of the cameras that we're seeing now, so this is part of the process of what you have access to. So in some cases where we may have needed three cameras, we may only need one. Because there's cameras in this bid that actually have four lenses on them. So if you can find really good locations to place them, then you can actually reduce the number of cameras you have based on you know, this upgraded camera. And so while it may cost more on its own, when you look at the savings that you're going to have and not having to purchase multiple cameras, mm -hmm. it starts making sense financially. So I think that's part of going back and walking, yes. is to understand what, what can we do now with the new cameras. Now, when we talk about what we have planned community-wide, we're in the neighborhood of hundreds mm -hmm. in terms of what we're putting in our parks and other locations. And, so it's not anything new that we're doing, it's just a continuation of what we're doing. Um, and, you know, what I would say to you all in terms of the housing authority properties, they're vital. So um, about a year and a half ago, um, we had a domestic disturbance that led to a shooting. Um, at the neighborhood adjacent to Aston Meadow Apartments, we actually were able to go in and get into the camera system and full information that the police needed immediately to start figuring out who came from where, how did it end up going from there to the apartments, and, and get images of many of the characters that were involved. Holistically, what I will tell you is some of the preliminary data that I've received from some of the parks is that when we put them in, it did, in, in most cases, there was a double-digit decrease in calls for service. That's great. Um, and, and so, and in many significant events, we've used those cameras to help us solve um, and come to, come to resolution on issues in hours, if not a day, versus what could have historically taken us multiple days or weeks or less. And so, it's definitely becoming a multiplier in terms of our staff capacity and what we can and can't do. It does have a hint of Big Brother, though. It does, and I think we were, you know, we've talked to the council about, it. You're, we talked to you all in the council on this one. Um, it's just look, when you're looking at all of these challenges, we can't be everywhere at once. Exactly. We can't be at all places at all times. And, and I think that's when community members call us, let's mm -hmm. just utilize it. The other thing, on an operational basis, it lets us get a look at not only the housing authority properties, but city properties before we send maintenance crews and other crews out so we can actually get a sense mm -hmm. of what we need to do and um, and you know when we look at this and we look at the capabilities you know down the road whether it's this or other technology you know we can also utilize it when we talk about maintenance and landscaping and things is actually utilizing other technology to, to really get a sense of what's the moisture content in the soil, are we overwatering, are we underwatering? Yeah, yeah. And and so, you know, we're just kind of scratching the surface from a safety perspective. Uh, sounds amazing. Um, do you have anything to add to that, Molly? No? Nope, other than you won't be seeing this on the city council since that is allowed to uh, since it's not a no-cost IGA, so just the LHA board needs to review and approve. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, 
the uh, resolution uh, 24, 2024-14. Uh, Second. Okay, it's been moved by um, Commissioner McCoy to move the LIG 2024-14, seconded by Commissioner Hidalgo Faring. Um, any more discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor? Aye. Aye. All those opposed? That passes six to zero with count Commissioner Yarbrough absent. And now we're on our last resolution, LHA 2024-15, approved being easement agreed excuse me, approved being approving easement agreement in connection with the SIP development. Back to you, Molly. Well, I'm gonna I'm gonna tap in Katie for this one since this is one that came up in very short order, which is why it's at the end and not with the other percent item. Um, and so she took this one all the way through. So I'll let you go, Katie. Yeah, so this is a pretty straightforward um, resolution, again, related to the ascent development. And so we are obviously going through the site plan and um, plat approval process within the city. And there's currently a CenturyLink slash Newman easement underneath the proposed footprint of building. And so in order to, we need to vacate that easement and relocate the easement about five feet um, to the north, I believe, or to the west. Mm -hmm. um, and so since LHA is the current property owner, um, in order for the city to, in order for Lumen to vacate that easement um, and get that off the newly reported plot, um, they want their, a new easement in its place before they're willing to vacate. So um, the property is already covered by a, by a section Lumen easement, this is just in, in covering the new location um, of the easement due to the building location. Okay. All right, is there uh, any discussion by commissioners? Questions, comments? A quick question. Do they have to, it's currently just an easement, they don't have to move any infrastructure, do they? No, there's a, no, there's not any infrastructure okay. um, currently in place. All right, that's all I have. Do I make a motion? Sure, I'll, I'll move LHA 2024-15. Second. It's been moved by Commissioner um, Rodriguez, seconded by Commissioner Chris, to move 2024-15. Um, all those, let's vote. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. All those opposed? That passes 6-0 to zero with Commissioner Yarbrough absent. And now we move on to the Interim Executive Director's Report, Development Updates. Um. Okay. So, Ascent has been dominating Katie's life. <laughs> She's been doing an amazing job getting us to the finish line. It, certainly, um, there are wrinkles to this one that we have not hit before when we're adding in a commercial space. Uh, that really ended up um, complicating a couple things at the last minute. We're working our way through it. As you can see tonight, we're getting these resolutions done. Um, but there's just New, every single time we go through one of these, we recap on what we did well, especially in our case, what we did well based on our, our um, experiences. The last, this is I think our fourth closing in since May 2022. Um, so that's a lot for us, especially for, that's a lot of, for a large company authority. So we're a smaller one with a smaller team. And so that's, that's pretty wild. And so we have a very good set of um, lessons learned and things to uh, note for the next go around. And also things that we just did really well because we have um, been doing this now for four go arounds. And so uh, we're really working to get this to the finish line and with these new wrinkles uh, that we didn't really anticipate in the beginning, just from the nature of adding in a commercial space and how that works with the tax credit project, we're starting to note all of this, and um, we're going to try and put some, memorialize some of this after we make it through. So uh, closing is anticipated now. I think by the end of the July is still the goal, um, but there's a couple more steps still to take because there's a lot of moving pieces on this one and a lot of groups that are working on it. So it's all hands on deck. Um, but we're going to get there, and it's going to be great, and we're going to let Katie, take a breath afterwards. <laughs> She's going to do it all. Um, otherwise, 
the lynch is in full swing of construction still. We're starting to move to the exterior work. I highly recommend you go out and check out the brick stain. Um, I'm not sure, I left town on, on Friday morning, so I'm not sure how far around the building they've made, but they were doing it on the, uh, the south face when I left. It looks so great. Um, so we'll be doing a lot of work outside soon. The parking lot is shut down. We have residents. We bought parking permits at the spoke for residents to have for an extended amount of time just to make sure that um, while we have lifts in the parking lot for siding and actual parking lot work happening that nobody gets any vehicles damaged. Um, we're in our second to last phase of unit work and so I think our punch just got set for uh, our punch list walk to accept those units. This just got set for August 1st and then we'll be doing the last phase of unit move outs after that. Um, I think that other than that, that's the overall, but Katie, is there any other hot topics at Village going on right now that I missed? I don't, I think that I covered it pretty well. There's lots of moving parts. Um, the residents have been very patient in, in dealing with our work. There's a lot, there's a lot going on there. Um, and so I think we, over time, since you know we began this in January, have definitely had to kind of realize the best way to communicate, what to communicate, um, how, what level of detail works. So I think we um, had kind of a learning curve related to that. But I think you know working with Pinkard and we have a relocation uh, team who's all hands on deck with the residents as they're moving you know all of their belongings out of their home and moving into a hotel, um, it's a very impactful process for them. And so I think, again, we've uh, definitely had some learning experiences, but I think, you know, we've had a, the last couple talking conversations at Village, I've been attending in person and giving construction updates, and I feel like um, we've kind of hit a smooth path as much as it can be with um, our lines of communication and um, the understanding from the residents. Obviously, we still have you know, bumps here and there and unexpected um, things that are happening, but I think um, we kind of are on a good um, open line of communication. So I think we are nearing, uh, the, the, the lobby is getting close to completion, and so I think, again, the residents are now kind of seeing the fruits of, of the labor that's been happening for many months. They've obviously seen it in their units, but um, we've fully taken over their common areas, and so they'll they're very excited to get those back, and we're excited to have a have a finished um, product to to give back to them. So, yeah, we're, we're saying. That's really the oh, go ahead. I was going to say that's the extent of updates because those two projects are all hands on deck. So, <laughs> and there's some operational components that Lauren's working on in terms of file management, getting files, leasing up, but. Mm -hmm. um, when you look at work, you know, they make it sound easy. You can't imagine the amount of disruption that occurs when you're working on a property and you're going through this process because you literally have people living adjacent to units that are being reconstructed. And um, the noise, the disruption. The noise and the dark, I mean, it's just you can't minimize it. And, and so when you look at what we're working on, how, this is as significant as it gets. Mm -hmm. And so you have to shift and adjust your staffing in order to manage those situations. Did, uh, was the issue with the flooring ever resolved? Remember when? At, at Aspen Meadows? Mm -hmm. so oh, the, yeah. The, were you asking Aspen Meadows? Or yes. 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 Okay. Mm -hmm. um, the, Flooring subcontractor has provided a proposal to Palace, the general contractor, and we're waiting for them to package that up and send it our way. So okay. it was, I had an update last week, so I'm hoping it comes in this week. Okay, great. Yeah, yeah the letter you all. Go ahead. The, the letter that you all agreed with us sending oh. had an impact. Oh, good. That that was good. It was. Okay. Thank you. That was very impactful. Great. Helpful. <laughs> and, uh, on, on some, of these, some of these development projects, I'm looking at Eugene. Eugene caught me up to speed today on the set because we actually had another issue, kind of, and how we look at the waivers and what that looks like. And 
because it is a different project. And thank Eugene and the attorney's office for helping us figure out a path forward on that because that one could have very well have ended up in another scramble and other items to bring to you also. When we say all hands on deck and everybody coming in, it's literally, we're tapping everyone's mind. Because when you get in these closing pieces, there's always nuances to it. And um, we plan well, we do it, but there's always something new that you just weren't thinking about. And it's because we've never had commercial early. This is the first project where we have the leasing office and the community space not part of the actual building where the units are located. And so all of those create some nuances that we have to work through. Great. Any more discussion or questions? Thank you, Molly. Yeah. Thank you, Katie. Thank you, Katie. The next one are update on operations of uh, three parts. Occupancy, occupancy report. Um, so this is the occupancy report that I put together that we would have had for the Housing Authority Advisory Board meeting. Um, so it's, mm -hmm. it's a little bit behind. We've had a few updates since then. Um, but mostly we're, we're doing better on our vacants. We're slowly working through them. The two biggest issues that we have currently and continue to have are, are you know, meth units. Yes. Um, we have two currently, one at the Suites and one at um, Aspen Meadows uh, neighborhood. And so um, before I had reported for the one at Aspen Meadows neighborhood that we were just pending a few things, but it's actually, that's the one that we partnered with Habitat to rebuild, oh, no. and so there is a significant amount of work that we need to do in the unit to bring it back. Um, and so we're comparing quotes, and we're going out to bid um, with contractors because we, while we do have the capacity to do some things in house, we don't want to overstress and overextend our staff. Mm -hmm. I mean, we are we're in a good place. I don't want to push us to a you know we're burning out staff. I mean, we're already. We're always on the precipice of nothing. Yeah, because we are a small but mighty team. Um, we noticed that last yeah. month. <laughs> yeah, and then the unit at the suites, um, we're just, you know, meth is a continuing issue and funding that sort of remediation work is not cheap and we don't really have a funding source for that. Um, so we're trying to figure out how we're gonna put that in the budget and um, what that's gonna look like. Um, we did have a, it says bad move outs, but it really just was unfortunately a resident passed away at Aspen Meadows Senior, mm -hmm. and the family was in the process of cleaning out their unit and basically <coughs> left everything behind. So um, this past week, our team got together and rented a, a <coughs> big rollout dumpster and cleaned out the unit. Um, so we're waiting on that to get cleaned up. Um, we are diligently working as Harold mentioned on leasing up Village on Main um, for the units that are vacant, where we've had people move out during, before or during the rehab project. Um, we had 14 uh, a couple weeks ago. We've leased up two of those units already, and so between our um, staff working on the recertifications of the people who are already there, and then people we have uh, Kat, the community manager, focusing on leasing up the remaining. Units. Um, so we're keeping busy with that. Um, i trying to think if there's anything else. And then working really close with MHP um, at the suites, because we always have a handful of MHP units that we ourselves can't fill. Um, so working really close with their team to identify um, residents and get those units leased up. I think we're aiming to have six. In the next couple weeks, we stuff. We've moved into the coordinated entry list yes. now, right? Yep. That Local may, case conferencing. Yeah, that may be good to start tapping mm -hmm. Alberto. Okay. Because he's involved in that side. Yeah. Um, and then with Zinnia, um, you know, we're not, I'm not doing occupancy yet for Zinnia because it's not actually done and open yet, but we are um, in the lease up process and we are actively uh, getting tenants. Um, through the application process, the background check, so that once we do get our certificate of occupancy on that project, we can get people moved in quickly um, for those units. So that will get added as we get to that point. Mm -hmm. Any questions on occupancy? 
Um, as far as Xenia goes, when you uh, when you lease these, are they are they furnished in any aspect at all? Yes, okay. they are fully furnished. Fully mm -hmm. furnished. Okay. Yeah. Great. Yeah, and it's the same way. But it's the same way at the suites um, because we have people coming from homelessness, unhoused. they they might not be coming with any belongings, so um, we want to make sure that they are set up for success. Mm -hmm. and they have what they need. I don't know what the plan is for Zinnia since we are not um, the owner, we're just the third party manager and special limited partner, but at the suites we do have the donation center. I don't know if that could expand possibly, um, but yeah, okay. we do for each Great. Any questions about Zinnia? I was just wondering, because of that, uh, for instance with the bad move out that you were talking about, are you able to salvage any of those? In most cases, if somebody moves out and they want to donate furniture, we get them to sign over. In this case, we tried to contact the family to ask them to sign that. Um, but I think that because the unit sat, it wasn't a situation where we could really keep the belongings. It was fairly full of stuff. So the decision was made to just clean it out. Yeah, I think when given the opportunity, they do. Um, there are always nuances and circumstances to every unit, and without going into a lot of detail, it's kind of a decision to make when you're walking through and seeing what's really there and what's happening around it and so on and so forth. Do you ever ask uh, Hope or the Era Center if they want to do a walkthrough and anything that they can use or that they... Or we have not done that in the past. Okay. Um, yeah, I think. I think we we would be open to doing that if it wasn't going to delay cleaning yeah. the unit and leasing it out. Yeah. Um, that makes if, sense. If it wasn't something that we were going to take ourselves, that was in good condition that we could transport. Mm -hmm. You know, well, we do have yeah. the sweets donation center mm -hmm. that we have utilized yeah. for anything yeah. that was usable. Yeah. Typically, yeah. we don't typically clean out typically throw away anything that's unless yeah. it's, uh, okay. it gets thrown away if it's been soiled. The meth unit yeah. was left or it's not, we don't, aren't confident that it was habitable. And there's some pieces yeah. of furniture that we're just not prepared to transport, like gigantic TV entertainment centers of oh, no. late oh. 2000s. Oh, <laughs> like yeah. my mom used to have, you know, big wooden oh, entertainment centers <laughs> with credenzas <laughs> and things like that. So it really yeah. just depends on the situation. Sounds good. Any other discussion on property updates? We are now at public health and safety updates. Oh, I have some more for the property if that was oh. occupancy, but I'm just going to run through some quick property updates. I sure. Didn't, I didn't Sorry. submit yeah. anything in writing. That's okay. okay. Um, but wanted to say that we promoted Summer, our one of our assistant community managers, to oh. community manager for Aspen Meadow Senior Neighborhood. Mm -hmm. So she started in that official capacity last week. We were very excited um, to be able to do that. And then we actually had a new employee, a new assistant community manager start um, yesterday, Vanessa. Oh, she is stationed over at Fall River Spring Creek. Uh, so today was her second day. Um, we also, as you probably know, um, were awarded $200,000 um, in CDBG funds for the suites to replace all the doors and the hardware. Great. Um, so we'll be working on the RFP process for that so that we can get those um, funds obligated and spent before any requirements. I think we'll get that right here. Yeah, as long as price don't work. The sooner the better. Um, we already talked about the flooring issue at Aspen Meadows Senior. Right. Um, talked about Village on Main. Fall River, Spring Creek, and, and really all the properties, um, the sprinklers are finally on, the mm. grass is green again, um, so we're finally to a place where we're getting that taken care of. The next big issue that um, we hear a lot about and that we're tracking is um, weeds. Uh, because we were focused on trying to get the landscape um, company to fix the irrigation systems, um, they have not been doing any uh, landscaping as far as weeds or trimming, so um, I'm waiting to schedule. I'm trying to schedule an appointment with the company now, with Patrick, our uh, maintenance supervisor, so that we can tackle that. Um, and you know, contracts can be contentious if we're not happy with the service. We definitely have um, things we can do. So if if we have to meet new, we will. Okay. Um, but it has been a difficult year. I think 
if you drive around in general, it's been incredibly hot and dry. Um, I've given up on my yard, so um, my grass is dead. So, but we don't we don't want that at every property, and the weeds are sort of taking over this year due to the dryness. So um, we'll be tackling that. Um, we talked about. Um, there's some other like maintenance, just general maintenance stuff going on now that we've got full maintenance team. Um, we're you know getting things done. The team's working really well together. I'm um, really happy. And then hiring updates. We've still got two assistant manager positions. Um, one that we're hiring for the Sweet Sensidia, and then the one that Summer vacated when she got promoted. And then the regional property manager position. We're working on opening that up as well. Great. So we're still, you know, looking, using the lens of have to, need to, want to, mm -hmm. um, because there's just things that pop up that weren't on the radar that all of a sudden become a have to. Mm -hmm. um, a good example of that at the suites is the elevator. Mm -hmm. So we, we're having significant elevator issues there, so we have to replace it. And and so that that's not uncommon across the portfolio properties. And I think as we get through this, it's also how do you build that um, ongoing maintenance and yeah. what you're doing? Because I think what we're starting to see now is when you have a lack of maintenance, mm -hmm. things will start showing themselves. It's not unlike what we dealt with here on our city facilities where you, you, you're just kind of moving along and all of a sudden you hear a lot of pop which then led to looking at the foundation of this facility, which then led to the library, which now obviously is led to safety and justice. Well, same situation with these properties. Mm -hmm. So have to, need to, want to is still something that we talk about in terms of what we're going to do and how we're going to approach it. Um, the question was brought up earlier about the phones. I was actually updated today on that issue. So the issue at Spring Creek and Fall River, and, and um, if you live in that neighborhood, <laughs> cellular service is just bad, oh, generally. Oh. Um, and, and I say that because I live in that neighborhood. And um, so literally there's points where you can be in certain areas of your home and all of a sudden it's just non-existent. Mm -hmm. um, that is the same issue that you have at Spring Creek and Fall River. Uh, but when you have these large commercial structures, that's obviously much different than it is in a home because of the materials they use to construct. Not unlike in this building where if you sit at my spot in the council room, during a council meeting, my phone will go to SOS because mm -hmm. that spot where I sit is not great. Mm -hmm. Eugene's may be fine. Where I sit, it's not fine. Um, in looking at that situation, they've evaluated a number of different options. Um, cell boosters um, were something that we looked at. They're incredibly expensive. Uh, and so when you look at the capacity within the budgets to actually do that, it's more difficult. Uh, we have been working with our next slide team, um, and it looks like they do have a solution um, to help with that. The, pro the challenge with that is it's a Wi-Fi solution. So it will only work on smartphones that have the ability to trigger Wi-Fi calling. Oh. If somebody has a phone that doesn't have that, so think flip phones and things like that, that's not necessarily going to be a solution. Um, and, and so that I've got a meeting with Valerie and the next slide team to talk through that and, and we'll include more on that. But it's understanding that. So there may be a partial solution. Mm -hmm. But there is not a full solution if you don't have the ability to shift a Wi-Fi call. Mm -hmm. And then you have to set the phones up to automatically connect to the Wi-Fi system. So there's some operational issues in that, but it, again, it's a cost issue. So when you're thinking of things like landscaping, these other issues, how do you fit that within that property's budget is something that starts coming into play. So I'm thinking weeds are not on need to. <laughs> and it's unfortunate because I don't want to tell people that. I know. It's important to them that where they live looks beautiful. Exactly. You know? And it's a dignity issue. And but yep. there's also the cost benefit analysis 
there's the time, how much staff is going to be involved. Um, so it, it's not it's not easy. No, I guess it. And to be honest, leads right now are in a situation we're chasing across the board, even within our parks department. You know, when you take the weather pattern that we've seen, mm -hmm. you take the wind that we had, um, even in areas that have the landscaping fabric and the rocks, the weeds aren't even rooting into the ground. They're just rooting into the dirt that's accumulated over time. <laughs> And, and so and for some reason grasshoppers and Japanese beetles don't eat the weeds I know they eat everything else they eat everything else yeah. that they want <laughs> so the weeds are going crazy dang Japanese beetles with everything else not you know yeah. blocking them out yeah. so again it's, it's balancing all of these it's balancing all these issues well if we import a bunch of tortoises they love weeds because yeah. my tortoise loves weeds wow. oh, there you go <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you got my yard don't eat my grass eat my weeds yeah. Yeah. Don't eat grass. every it's resident needs a tortoise weeds. <laughs> so, no, no. Um, so yeah. On, on the elevator thing, do you do you have a company, an elevator company? Okay. We um, have approved one of. We had two bids. We approved one. Um, okay. So we're waiting for them to come and do the modernization work um, as part of that, and then we'll have that one up and running. Will they be doing uh, ongoing maintenance as well? Mm -hmm. It's actually cheaper to, to cancel the current contract we have with a different company and move to the new one. Okay. Since they're going to do the modernization, it makes sense to have them doing the maintenance as well, and they were less expensive. Okay, great. Are those all the properties you're updating this on? Yes. Okay. Lauren's well, also going to do the next one. And then I've got um, Sarah Arnie's not here tonight, um, oh. but she sent me a list of items for the public safety update. Okay. Um, first one is that resident issues have been low. Um, as far as public safety, um, we haven't had a ton of calls for service, um, which is really great. Yes. You know, knock on anything wood. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, village on main cameras, you know, we talked a little bit about cameras. Um, she did a walkthrough um, yesterday and thinks that the cameras should be up and running in less than a month if all things go well. Um, we received a shipment of meth detectors today. So those are in a box waiting to be um, you know, put into units and we're working on identifying which units we're going to do and obviously we're only going to put those in units that we know are clean, vacant, tested negative because um, we're not going to put them in a unit that we don't know that information. Um, we are also planning on having fire drills in August for Spring Creek and Fall River. They've been asking for that and we were waiting for Vanessa to start so now that we have an assistant um, we can get that rolling. And then um, Sarah has been assisting us with background checks for Zinni and the Suites. Mm -hmm. um, we were having issues with our background check company before. We've worked out some of those kinks. Um, but we're having Sarah do sort of a inline review of what she has access to. And it's been great because a lot of the background checks will tell us, um, you know, schedule one, someone was arrested for misdemeanor, felony, schedule one drug, something like that. If we don't actually know some of the details and mm -hmm. so she's able to provide that detail which is important because um, at Zinnia we have a very limited uh, scope for denying because it is housing first mm -hmm. um, and they are state housing vouchers we are only denying um, for um, certain things and so we need that that information as a backup for that process so it's been really good to have her doing that um, I think that's everything that she had so, uh, something that's coming to light on uh, public health and safety updates. So, obviously in the camera conversation I talked a little bit about, and you've all been receiving these emails in terms of what's occurring at Lady Park. So, um, to give you a sense, we've been really active over there in the last two weeks. Um, especially late last week and then into this week. Um, I personally, been out there with police parks um, dealing with issues um, trespassing individuals for drug use and other things what we're starting to find is there's a location that so when we ask them about those neighborhood there's a vacant lot adjacent to it and that vacant lot is privately owned mm -hmm. and 
Sarah's been working to try to get a trespass affidavit because if you're driving on 21st and you see the substation that's there and mm -hmm. then across the railroad tracks there's a series of trees but there's mm -hmm. three trees that are Russian olives which under the state definition are noxious trees that should be removed. Mm -hmm. It's pretty closed in. What we're seeing is the issues that we're seeing at Lanyon Park are also connected to individuals that are in those trees. Mm -hmm. We're also starting to get input from Aspen Meadow neighborhood, and I just got briefed on this this morning or yesterday afternoon, that they're going into the patios in the neighborhood and there's been some theft issues. So when I talk about data and what we're looking at with cameras, that's likely to be again one of the first locations. But we're now seeing the nexus of issues in that area. Mm -hmm. and, and so I say that to you all because um, if we're able to get the um, trespassing affidavit and talk to the individual that owns that property, uh, because of the impact to the affordable housing immediately adjacent to it, because of the use of drugs in that location and the proximity to the sidewalk where there's a lot of children mm -hmm. moving back and forth, um, and because in the area I've personally been notified by indiv individuals about potential selling or attempted selling mm -hmm. drugs to, to young individuals, we're asking the individual to cut those trees. Mm -hmm. If they're not willing to cut those trees uh, because of the public safety and health issues that we're seeing, I've talked to David Bell about that's one that we need to probably get in and do as a city mm -hmm. because of the impact to the housing authority properties, mm -hmm. the park, and the individuals that are in that immediate area. So I say that because we build these reports and all of a sudden information comes into us you know, after these reports are compiled. And, and so I know that there, it, there has been some feedback from people that live in the neighborhood mm -hmm. and I wanted to let you all know we're aware of it. We're assessing the situation, figuring out options because mm -hmm. it is becoming more of an issue. So I have curiosity, if you, if you find a trespasser and you issue some kind of a, a warrant or I don't know what you issue, what do you issue a fine? So it depends. Um, you know, the first time it's you're trespassing, you can't be there. If they're there again, then you start issuing citations. You know, the problem is just getting them through the system. That's and, what I was you know, we had a case where we had one individual that I believe that had 10 to 12 trespassing violations. Um, and just getting it through the system is, is, is tough right now. Mm -hmm. And I say that, I say the court system. And, and so it depends on where it is. You know, if it's on our property, um, we actually, and we need to get the standards of behavior applied to our housing authority properties. We have the ability to take a civil approach, which is you can't be here and we suspend people. So when I say I suspended people, we suspend them for X number of days based on the activity. Um, Eugene and I talked a little bit about amping it up to having a more severe level. Um, then if they come back, you actually issue a civil violation, not a criminal violation, which I think is a little easier for us to move through. Um, but it's diligence and it's staying on top of it. And you know, I will tell you one of the individuals that I trust that I was with the police on where we trespassed them. I drove by and they were there again, oh. and so I had to call them again, and. Uh, and, and so that's just part of a more holistic approach that we're going to take with the housing authority, with the city, in terms of we need everybody's eyes um, to, to deal with situations. Um, the other property where we're having some challenges on, and I would argue that most of those challenges actually occur external to the property. So when we talked about the suites and some of the challenges, I think we talked about this in the last session, the majority of issues that we're having there are actually not from today the residents of the suites. Mm. It's the individuals that are adjacent to the suites trying to interact with the residents of the suites. 
And, and that is another situation that's connected to a different problem that we're having. And that's the problem that we're having in the underpass on Hoover mm -hmm. in the area adjacent to the Village of the Peaks. Um, and it's because that area is just a pass-through. Mm -hmm. um, and so that's another example of where on the city side and the housing authority side we have to work together. Mm -hmm. um, the Swedes was not a property that we had funding for cameras on. Um, at five and a half percent interest, our ARPA interest is doing really well. Um, so I'm probably going to take some ARPA funds to find the camera and installation at the suites okay. and in the area along the greenway in the back because that's not just a housing authority issue, that's that's a broader city issue in terms of the activities that we're seeing there. Um, and, and so right now, the, what I've been updated on recently is the ancillary issues adjacent to Aspen Meadows neighborhood and the suites are probably rising up pretty fast in terms of what we collectively are going to have to do with both from the city side and the housing authority side. I thought that with the neighborhood resource team and the good work they were doing is that this would go down, but it's... They're doing a great job. Yeah. I mean, that's the thing. They're doing a great job, and it's just, you know, when we talk about this, it's you know, and we talked about this today with the FEMA administrator, it's how, how, how do we become nimble and how can we move? Mm -hmm. and, and, and they're trying to do it and there's just things we have to work through. Yeah. Um, and I really think this is going to be a larger topic that we're going to bring to you all as the council, but we'll, pro we'll also have to bring it to you all as the Housing Authority Board in terms of some things that we're going to need to consider. Any discussion from commissioners? Okay, well, I think you for all the work you're doing. And I'm glad that you uh, aren't getting burned out yet. <laughs> Depends on the day. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, did I ask Commissioner Cummings? I did. Do you have any? Okay. Move we adjourn? Second. Oh, I'm sorry. I didn't. I didn't understand what you said. I thought, move we adjourn. Oh uh, yeah. <laughs> it was seconded by uh, Commissioner Chris. Mm -hmm. um, all those in favor, say aye. 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 All those opposed, we are adjourned. That passes. Zero. Commissioner Yarbrough.